Okay, well, welcome everyone to the uh, the third program in this four uh, program series, the Winter Lecture Series uh, in Lincoln. Uh, I hope I'm welcoming you back, but if not, I welcome you if you happen to miss the first couple of lectures. Uh, uh, just recently, we learned that if you would like to uh, to stream the earlier lectures, not only can you go to the uh, Unitarian Church of Lincoln's uh, YouTube site, you can you can also go directly to the Unitarian Church website, and you can pull down and you can see uh, the previous lectures as soon as they're uploaded uh, into the into the system. Uh, I think you're. You're all muted and your videos should be off so we can give full attention to our speaker. Uh, as I say, this is the third and fourth. Uh, we have one more next week. Uh, but without further ado, what I'd like to do is, is introduce uh, Professor David Forsyth, uh, who many of you know, uh, distinguished uh, Professor Emeritus of Political Science, uh, who is going to introduce the speaker, and he knows the speaker. We, you know, we've shifted from uh, two historians now to two political scientists, and this is right up Dave's alley. So I will pass the mic to him, and I'll I'll hide myself. Go ahead. Thank you, Peter. I want to take just a couple of minutes to situate uh, the talk tonight in our series. I was thinking back about the first lecture by Professor Borstelman who gave a really fine overview of American diplomatic history. And it occurred to me that one could use our theme about bipartisanship or partisanship, polarization or its lack, to cover some of his same ground, but it's, it's a kind of useful way to cut into the subject to talk about the extent of consensus or not in US diplomacy or foreign policy, whatever you wish to call it. For example, if we take some ideas from the first lecture, I would say that there was a great deal of consensus in this country, bipartisan support for certain ideas that Professor Borstelman talked about, manifest destiny, that we were destined to become a great and powerful uh, nation state. Uh, the Monroe Doctrine, that uh, it was really our role to dominate the Western Hemisphere and other powers should stay out. Uh, American exceptionalism, that we were really a shining city on the hill and a force for good in the world. I think on all these uh, basic ideas about US foreign policy, there has been across time a great deal of bipartisanship. At the same time, if you look at some critical junctures that Professor Borstelman talked about, uh, you can see that there was plenty of uh, partisan and other disagreement. I, I think especially World War I and the follow-on diplomacy of the interwar years was, was a very crucial time. It's when Woodrow Wilson wanted to move away from unilateralism toward multilateralism, to move away from the idea that we never engaged in entangling alliances, but of course wanted us to join the League of Nations. And all of that was firmly opposed by Henry Cabot Lodge, Republican of Massachusetts. So particularly in that crucial era, I think you can see much partisanship and clearly disagreement did not stop at the water's edge. Uh, there was lots of partisan disagreement about uh, US foreign policy, particularly around World War I and the Versailles peace agreement uh, and thereafter. Much later, I would say, again, continuing to to, to pick up cer certain subjects that Professor Borstelman talked about, I think there was great bipartisan consensus um, that we should engage in global containment of communism. I think that had bipartisan support. 
But then when you come to some particulars, uh, like should we be fighting in Korea? And of course, should we be fighting in Vietnam uh, to contain global communism? Uh, one saw a profound disagreement, some of it partisan, and sometimes the disagreement didn't break out along partisan lines. But again, I think thinking about things in terms of partisanship or polarization versus bipartisanship or cross-party agreement is a useful way, one useful way to cut into some of these events. Of course, even if one starts with polarization or its lack, bipartisanship or uh, its lack, things change over time, events change. I think, for example, when uh, Truman decided to fight in Korea in 1950, there was kind of bipartisan deference. Maybe it wasn't consensus, but there was bipartisan deference. And three years later, he was very unpopular. And um, the Republican Eisenhower uh, got elected in 52, in part because Truman and the Democrats were so unpopular over Korea. And yet in 1950, when we went in, uh, there wasn't all that much uh, public disagreement. And of course, who controls the White House affects um, how some of the disagreements are, are expressed. If we quickly shift to our second speaker, uh, Professor Green, talking on China, you can see, for example, at certain key points, there is great bipartisanship about uh, US approach to China. Of course, it was Nixon in 1971 and 1972 that made the opening to China, even if part of the effort to contain the Soviet Union, give the Soviet Union something to worry about on its long border with China. It was Nixon who made that first step, but it was Carter who recognized formally uh, the the communist regime in China in 1978. So there was bipartisan agreement on that. And yet, particularly the right wing of the Republican Party was very hawkish and uh, did not really like all that much uh, better relations with China. And you saw the same sort of disagreement when you had Nixon and Kissinger and Ford for the Republicans pursuing detente with the Soviet Union, well, the hawkish wing, the hawkish faction of the Republican Party, sometimes called the neocons, uh, was not very happy uh, with those developments. So I think a lot can be said about American diplomatic history and contemporary foreign policy by thinking about polarization or its lack in foreign affairs, bipartisanship or its lack in uh, U.S. foreign policy. Have no fear. I do not see myself as giving the talk tonight, and I'm going to stop with the substantive commentary at that point, but I did want to remind our readers uh, about the theme of the lecture and how to view some of the historical remarks that our first two speakers uh, made. Tonight, uh, we're very pleased to have James N. Scott with us from TCU in Fort Worth. I will start his introduction by pointing out that uh, I would say early in his serious professional career, he was at UNK in Kearney. Um, and in fact, he still has connections uh, with Nebraska. He is linked to the uh, Great Plains Center at UNL, and we're very happy about that. Um, while he is at uh, TCU now, along the way, he taught at Oklahoma State uh, and some other very good places. And so he has a very uh, fine and distinguished uh, career in higher education over the past few decades. He has been on the editorial staff of a number of very uh, important publications in the field of political science, foreign policy, international relations. I'm thinking of his editorial role 
uh, on the Political Research Quarterly, also the journal Foreign Policy Analysis. And quite recently, he has been the lead editor for International Studies Perspectives, which is one of the more important publications of the International Studies Association. And he has won a couple of awards from that uh, professional group. Um, I know him very well as a co-author of a textbook on international relations, which has gone through at least three editions the last time uh, I looked at that. He is also co-author of a text on US foreign policy, which has gone through seven editions. Uh, and that is certainly relevant to our proceedings tonight. He is also the author of several specialized books on US foreign policy and international relations, a couple of these published with Duke University Press, uh, which is a very fine uh, academic publisher. He, of course, has, in addition to these major works, uh, multiple uh, journal articles, and it would take up the rest of the evening to, to survey that. And so happily for everybody, I'm not going to do that. Uh, I am uh, with great pleasure going to, uh, as they say, uh, turn the floor over to Jim Scott. Dave, thank you very much for that very generous introduction and for the invitation to join uh, this tonight. I'm very excited to be able to offer a few comments, uh, plugging into the themes that you so aptly summarized and uh, uh, focusing my comments on the topic of Russia in the more polarized uh, American foreign policy environment. So I'm going to share my screen and go through some comments and then uh, we'll have time for some conversation. So let's get this going. I trust that that has worked. And here we go. Uh, so again, delighted with this opportunity, uh, a real pleasure to be able to reconnect uh, with my friends and, and the institutions around Lincoln and the university uh, in its, all its various forms and places. Uh, so for much of the post-World War II period, which is where I'll be focusing my attention, uh, the USSR and then Russia is kind of a great organizing point for uh, U.S. foreign policy and really for the politics of U.S. foreign policy as well. Uh, this maybe rests in part on the, the clarity of the threat and its effect on purpose that, that this uh, issue um, created and established for American policymakers. Uh, but it generated quite a bit of consensus, as, uh, as Dave has suggested, about uh, what the U.S. should do in the world, its role and engagement, uh, even while there's de debate over other things. Uh, Vietnam marked really the end of that consensus in, in most of its forms, and the end of the Cold War marked the end of the priority, of course, of the Soviet Union. And since then, the changing foreign policy environment and uh, uh, the partisan discord and political polarization that has been a hallmark of the last three decades really created a kind of a politics as usual theme to American foreign policy that has contended with the uh, politics stops at the water's edge premise that uh, the, the late Senator Arthur Vandenberg once used to characterize bipartisanship. Uh, my focus on this tonight is going to be fairly simple, I think. I'm going to walk us through, uh, let me get here, walk us through three kinds of points. I'm going to set a context, uh, a lens, if, as it were, to look at uh, some of the, the pathways to the present and the con current conditions, focusing on issues of partisanship and bipartisanship, the consensus and dissensus and polarization, uh, particularly since the end of the Cold War. I want to focus in on U.S. foreign policy and the Russia challenge, especially in the more polarized environment and especially uh, in the more recent last few years. And then we'll draw out some conclusions to try to understand uh, some of the key touch points on Russia policy in this polarized era, and especially right now and into the future. Uh, so 
Uh, I, I want to start by talking about the nature of partisanship and bipartisanship and offer you some ideas about how we might understand this. Partisanship is pretty easy to understand. It's the sort of tribalism that happens when uh, birds of a feather flock together. So Democrats stick with Democrats, Republicans stick with Republicans in voting behavior and, and other kinds of things. Uh, and, and partisanship has been the hallmark of the political times at a number of points in American history. Uh, as uh, as Davis suggested, um, but that's not been the case uh, consistently since World War II, since the U.S. assumed its more global role in foreign policy and the world. Um, then, since World War II, bipartisanship on foreign policy has been much more common, although, again, not fully consistent. But a way to think about bipartisanship is to draw on the work of Jordan Tama and, and the work he's done with a, a colleague or two and distinguish between three kinds of potential partisanship situations. The classic one that we that we think of when we think of bipartisanship is pro-presidential bipartisanship. The idea that a substantial majority uh, in Congress uh, and in the country, um, cutting across party lines, supports the foreign policy approach and initiatives and decisions of the president. Uh, whether that's uh, deference or acquiescence or accommodation or support, uh, it, it all washes out the same way. Uh, but there's also a way to think about bipartisanship, as uh, Jordan uh, Tama suggests, that, that we could call anti-presidential bipartisanship. And this is when the substantial majority across party lines takes the position opposing presidential initiatives for one reason or another, to try and restrict, rein in, or prod presidents to do things that they, uh, that they don't want to do. Um, and there are actually a pretty substantial number of those instances over time during the high Cold War, during the post-Vietnam period, during the end of that period and into the post-Cold War world, and, and even at present. Um, and then finally, we can think about cross-partisanship which is the situation that happens when small factions or coalitions of uh, members from the Democrat and Republican parties align themselves in these, in these working coalitions on particular topics and try to shape or affect policy as well. They usually are in a competitive sense that there's more than one of these. Uh, they usually vie uh, over the, the direction of policy uh, or its, its means. Uh, but they they effectively they they are rival alliances of sorts, and and that also has a, a, a lengthy record in American foreign policy history, and as we'll see on Russia potentially uh, as well. So that's the first uh, uh, staple that we want to bring some clarity on. The second has to do with this Cold War consensus, uh, which is uh, the the bipartisan uh, golden era in many respects. Uh, after World War II and up until Vietnam, the, the broad support um, for uh, American foreign policy based on the twin pillars of containment of the Soviet Union and the development of a liberal international order that turned on institutions and uh, free trade and those sorts of things, those two endeavors linked together, captured a substantial amount of support across parties. And the, the graphic there kind of demonstrates the connections among members uh, in the 50s, uh, members of Congress in the 50s and, and how they, they were deeply connected with one another. So this, this Cold War consensus had a policy consensus dimension, uh, agreement on the, the aims of American foreign policy and often uh, its, its particulars. And where debate existed, it was over how to do things and to what extent to do things, uh, which is not to mask the, the real disagreements at times, but the, the, the general direction of the train on the tracks was a, a shared direction. There was also, and resting on that policy consensus, a kind of procedural consensus where uh, presidential leadership in foreign policy was supported and accepted again by broad bipartisan majorities in Congress, not necessarily because the president must lead or is supposed to lead or is empowered to lead by the constitution, but maybe because of policy agreement and the sense of purpose that was shared. 
Uh, to be sure, presidents have advantages, and, and we could spend a lot of time on that. It's one of the things I really like to talk about, but, but we won't. Within that consensus, this Cold War consensus, which runs from the late 40s until the end of the 60s uh, and the, the Vietnam experience, there were variants uh, uh, of approaches to foreign policy. There were debates over the extent to which this action or that, this means or those means were most appropriate, but there was less debate over the, the, the general direction. One way to understand that is to draw on the work of uh, Ole Holstein and James Rosenau and then uh, Eugene Whitcoff from 1990, both of those works. Uh, and they, they basically characterized foreign policy orientations and views during the Cold War consensus as differentiated along two dimensions. Uh, support for militant internationalism, which is uh, the willingness to deploy uh, force and arms uh, actively or in basing and, and, and aid and that sort of thing. And support for cooperative internationalism, which is the willingness to engage in institutions and alliances, treaty building, those sorts of things. And if you distinguish between high and low support for each of those dimensions, as both of these authors did, you end up with four kinds of foreign policy views. Hardliners who were supportive of militant internationalism, but not as supportive for the cooperative stuff. Um, accommodationists who were highly supportive of cooperative internationalists, but not so much of the militant. Uh, internationalists who support both and isolationists who support neither. So this is helpful because it captured a lot of the foreign policy debate. And if you wanna think about the Cold War consensus, you can think about it being situated something like this. The, the debates in US foreign policy centered on the darkest spot of these ovals where, uh, where the, the lion's share of the viewpoints fell into the internationalist camp with some hardline and accommodationist perspectives worked in. To be sure, there were those who took other views. There were still uh, isolationist kinds of views, but they tended to be at the margins and not central to the debate. And the Cold War consensus rested on, on this, this perspective. Multiple streams of research suggest that this is the case. Uh, now, again, this hides some disagreements. In, in my foreign policy book uh, with Gerald Rosati, we talk about this period of time as being characterized by uh, uh, sequential uh, stages of accommodation, antagonism, acquiescence, and then awakening. So we wouldn't want to pretend that there weren't disagreements, but the, the sense of shared endeavor was really strong. So that, that kind of gives us a sense of the Cold War consensus. Uh, since Vietnam, this consensus has uh, struggled, uh, perhaps completely disappeared. Uh, uh, there is much, much less agreement on shared direction and shared fate. And to the extent that we get it, it tends to circulate around particular issues or events that, that are short-lived. So the, the graphic on this screen sh shows the disagreement and the polarization and partisanship that characterizes relationships between members of Congress uh, in, in the more uh, current era. This, I think, is from 2011. So after Vietnam, the, the ideological polarization and partisanship really starts to increase and in disagreement over the policy directions and the means, the purposes uh, of U.S. foreign policy uh, really grows. These ideological and partisan divides affect virtually every debate in foreign policy one way or another, some more, some less. In Congress, it affects party leaders and what they do, the voting of rank and file, and, and so on uh, and so forth. We can say a couple of things about, about this. It got worse in the post-Cold War. So the dissensus that happens when the Soviet Union disappears and the Cold War is over uh, is a, is a, affects both of those areas of consensus that I mentioned before. The policy consensus shifts and, and really dries up completely because as uh, former CIA director James Woolsey once said, uh, the end of the Cold War was much like um, slaying the dragon that you were faced with and being left with a world of snakes hiding in the grass, dangerous to be sure, more difficult to spot, harder to figure out what to do about and much less focusing than that great dragon. Uh, so the policy, uh, arena changes and the policy preferences 
start to diffuse as well. Beyond that, there's a procedural chain, the procedural consensus, which had frayed and, and disappeared in the face of the imperial presidency concerns of the 1970s and 80s, gives way to this beyond the water's edge perspective where the politics of US foreign policy become much more significant. Uh, and and uh, disagreement over decision making roles and and tools and means become much more uh, pronounced. So if we think about that, a, a couple of things we can say in terms of patterns. Uh, and I so I don't want to overstate this case, but I want to just make three quick observations. We know this from a lot of research from a lot of different people. I won't take the time to be bibliographic on this. But uh, as we move into this more dissensus oriented era, um, polarization and partisanship, which is the hallmark of the era overall, is less pronounced on foreign policy than domestic policy. There's still more policy agreement and less partisanship and polarization in the foreign policy arena than in the domestic policy arena. Most studies show this. Well, that's the first, so recognize that. But the second is foreign policy itself is more polarized and partisan than it was previously. So foreign policy doesn't have to be as polarized or partisan as domestic policy to be more polarized and partisan than it was during the heyday of the Cold War consensus. And then finally, the research onto this topic suggests that some issues enjoy more bipartisan consensus than others with international security issues being more likely to have broad support across party lines and international economic and other kinds of issues enjoying much less. In between those, that the crop of issues called intermestic issues are, uh, are pretty uh, challenging as well and, and subject to partisanship and polarization. So when you think about the polarized present in, in that way, Another way to think about it is to just think about the foreign policy views we just talked about. So Holstein, Rosenau, and Witkoff say there are these four archetypal views that dominate the elites and the public during the Cold War. A decade later, Rosati and Creed, doing a similar kind of study, not two dimensions, but five, uncover six foreign policy views among elites and, and the public that contend with each other. And that, of course, reflects the, uh, the uh, adjustment, the altering by elites of their foreign policy orientation um, as they absorb the really profound global changes that, that occur in the, the years leading up to the end of the Cold War and after, that, and updating their belief systems to do so. That's a slow process. But then fast forward another decade, and Chris Dolan's work uh, on the post 9-11 period, uh, takes the similar approach as the Rosati and Creed one and identifies nine contending foreign policy viewpoints. Now, I think that the, the takeaway from this is it's gonna be a, a significantly harder task to forge consensus when viewpoints are more conf, uh, diffused and, and uh, in competition with one another as the last uh, panel on this graphic suggests. So I think I think this helps us to situate what's going on with Russia policy uh, a little bit as well. We can see it in a couple of other ways. Let's focus finally on the context of partisanship and polarization, uh, because this is, as I said, a real serious hallmark of the political condition uh, increasingly over the years after Vietnam. So here's a couple of uh, quick snapshots that show the the distance between average Democrats and Republicans uh, over a period of time. And you can see in the more recent period, you've got this really clustering and, and tribalism. And that's what we mean by polarization, right? The, the distance between members ideologically or, or, or people in the public, right? Partisanship is the clustering behavior where they stick to their tribes, right? Polarization is the gap between the tribes. We can see it in some really important ways. Look at Congress and the average ideology uh, uh, based on the DW nominate data in the Senate and the House uh, over 50 years from the 92nd Congress to the 117th. And you can see that in both chambers of Congress, uh, the gap between Republican and Democrat increases about six times. It's about five or so points on this, uh, this scale, um, which runs from 
uh, minus one to plus one. Uh, and in it's, you know, it's about five or so in 1970. It's about 30 or so, a little bit more uh, in, in the last Congress, the 117. All right. So you'll also note that while Democrats are, are somewhat more liberal, Republicans are substantially more conservative. Much of the gap that has been created or grown is a function of Republican move to the right. That is what we mean by polarization, really. I like to see it in this way. Here, here's a real practical takeaway when you think about what presidents have to deal with and why pro-presidential bipartisanship might be more difficult to come by over time. Uh, this graph represents the average presidential approval for each president and administration from Eisenhower to Biden. The uh, blue line represents how the president's own party views the president, and the orange line, view, it represents how the other party views the president. And you can see the gap that's grown, right? Before the end of the Cold War, uh, the out party, the other party approval rating of the president never fell below 30 and was, uh, the gap was 50% or more only once. After the end of the Cold War, the gap between the two never gets below 50 points. And it, indeed, it's grown into the 70s at present with Trump and Biden. Uh, and the out party or other party approval rating never gets above 30% on average for the president. That makes bipartisanship a more tricky prospect, right? Presidents don't enjoy support from the other party and can't generate it or appeal to it. There's less instincts to defer. Um, there's also the political calculation, right? Which is the unpopularity of the other party leader in the White House is an incentive for members of Congress not to go along, or at least to play politics to, to, to some degree for, uh, for political gain. So that I think is the is the context. Now, what I want to do is I want to focus uh, us in on some of the issues with respect to Russia, with with these things in mind, and then we'll make try to make some sense out of it. Maybe to think about this, I just throw up some some key uh, events or issues that have transpired since the end of the Cold War uh, between the U.S. and Russia that that mark serious policy issues, challenges, initiatives, and so on uh, for American presidents from. Uh, from Bush and Clinton uh, to Biden. Uh, immediate, in the immediate aftermath of the Cold War, you have the effort to engage with Russia as a, as a partner uh, in, a, in a partnership for peace and, and, and its related NATO expansion. Uh, you've got a little while after that in the, in the 2008 period, you've got Russian military activity under, under Putin's leadership in Georgia. You've got the Obama effort to try and reset U.S.-Russian relations in the wake of the Georgia episode to be more productive, including a, an effort to create a new strategic arms treaty. Uh, 2014 marks the Russian seizure of Crimea and then the subsequent Little Green Men intervention in the eastern parts of Ukraine. Uh, Russian election meddling, not just in the U.S., but all over Europe, uh, uh, well-established. Uh, sanctions episodes for human rights issues, for uh, for election meddling, and now for Ukraine, uh, Russian engagement in, in Syria, and of course the current uh, Ukraine invasion. So what what I ask is, what so think about this? What story can you tell through these instances? We could tell a lot of them, I'm sure, but given the focus of our talk tonight and our topic for this series, I want to focus in on, on one particular kind of, of, of uh, understanding here. So, so if we think about that sweep, we go from thaw to reset to confrontation, and maybe that's nicely represented by a series of pictures of presidents and uh, Russian leaders. Uh, from, the, from the thaw with Yeltsin and Clinton to the confrontation between Obama and Putin captured in a very memorable photo, the very uncomfortable kind of uh, relationship between Trump and Putin and, and, and one of great concern to many, and the cold conflict-oriented relationship. Uh, this is a picture of President Biden and, and Vladimir Putin in their only face-to-face -face meeting during his presidency so far. Uh, the story that I would tell through this is a story that, that has to do with partisanship and more specifically, bipartisanship. So 
all across the initiatives, the, the episodes that were listed on the previous screen and are represented in, in these photographs, there's just a, a whole spate of substantial pro-presidential bipartisanship. Uh, presidents from Clinton to Biden enjoy broad uh, support across parties for, for engaging with, resetting, confronting, and, 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 and resisting uh, Russia and its leadership across the various issues. Uh, over and over again, um, the, the, the agreement carries the day. It's not to say there isn't disagreement, uh, but there's significant agreement on policy support, legislatively and otherwise. I could introduce example after example. I, I, I'll maybe do that in Q&A. At the same time, the underlying dynamics of the period also create a real incentive for what I would call uh, political position taking uh, during this period. So even while members of the party opposite the president are providing bipartisan support for the policy initiatives, they're engaging in political position taking and attacks for electoral and other kinds of reasons, I think they fall into two categories, uh, typically across this time period. Uh, one is what I would call the, the bidding war approach, which is, you know, the, the approach that says, yes, you're dealing with an important issue, but you're not doing enough. We could do more. Um, and then the other is the blame game uh, position taking, which is the you, you, you're to blame for the problem as it now exists. I'm supporting the effort to do something about it, but it's your fault that we're in this situation in the first place. President Biden's getting quite a bit of that from the Republican side. Uh, uh, you know, George Bush and Bill Clinton and Barack Obama all got that. And, and Donald Trump faced a, a different kind, which is my third point. Uh, all through this, uh, this storyline, there are ample instances of, uh, or at least occasional instances of anti-presidential bipartisanship, situations in which the majority of Congress resists presidential initiatives. This is especially true uh, in the Trump administration, where even when the Republican Party controlled both chambers of Congress, they took action to defy uh, Trump's, President Trump's uh, initiatives, um, uh, for example, imposing sanctions uh, on, on Russia for its election meddling. Uh, and in a really notable clause to that, writing into the bill a measure that made it really hard, if not impossible, for the president to lighten those sanctions. It's usually the other way around, right? Congress will pass a law to impose sanctions and then write waivers to let the president get around him. In this case, they wrote a law on sanctions and wrote a, wave, wrote a measure to prevent waivers out of fear that President Trump would not do Congress's bidding. Broadly bipartisan on that. Um, the last thing that I would tell as a part of the story that runs through this is the growing fragmentation and cross-partisanship of the, of the viewpoints of members of Congress and, and it manifests itself in actions. Uh, increasingly, there's, there's dissenting views of note within each party uh, that, that are more alike to the dissents of members of the other party, even though they're not majority. Uh, than they are alike to their own party. And I want to use the more specific focus on the current Ukraine situation to uh, kind of illustrate that as well. So about a year ago, as you all know, uh, Vladimir Putin decided to ride the Russian bear across the border into Ukraine, hoping for a lightning fast win, and, and he didn't get it. Uh, naturally, uh, this has caused a lot of uh, uh, thinking and, and commentary along a lot of dimensions. For our purposes, we want to focus in on, on the, the bipartisanship and or partisanship in the U.S. response um, that, that uh, was orche the orchestrated by President Biden. Um, so what, what I would tell you about this is, is several things. And using those bipartisanship features and dimensions as our organizing tool. Since 2014, which is when Crimea was seized, and accelerating in the 2022-2023 period, uh, there is a, a, a substantial record. The, the, the loudest theme in the story is pro-presidential bipartisanship. Broad support for bipartisan sanctions legislation uh, 
in 2022 after the invasion. Broad, extensive support for military, economic, and humanitarian aid, really going back to 2014, uh, but especially since uh, the Russian uh, in invasion. I mean, in, the, in May 2022, the only aid bill for Ukraine aid that was a standalone bill and thus wasn't connected to any other factors that might have swayed member decisions. It passed overwhelmingly with 39 out of 50 Republicans uh, joining uh, uh, all Democrats. And in the House, three quarters of the House Republicans joined all the Democrats for that first $40 billion uh, aid bill. Um, similar bipartisan majorities approved uh, more than 12 billion in the fall, although that had some riders and, and some other connections. And, and then just this last December, Congress and this broad bipartisan majority added 8 billion to the 37 billion that the administration requested. You're not doing enough, we should do more. That's that uh, bidding war kind of approach. Uh, so so they're, they're, they're just the story is one of, of bipartisanship and support, um, surely driven in part by the sense of threat and the sense of purpose uh, that underlies the situation. Almost certainly uh, driven also by a, a legacy of uh, U.S. relationships with Russia over, over the years in the Cold War uh, as well. There's a few instances of anti-presidential bipartisanship in this where, uh, where uh, Congress has, has precluded some activities that uh, the president has sought, but mostly it's a bipartisan story. The subtext to it, though, is that partisan political position taking that I mentioned uh, as hallmark of the time. So Republicans, as you can see, the vast majority of them are supportive of the kinds of things that, uh, that the Biden administration has been seeking to do over the last year or so. But in their talk about the issue, they have criticized the Biden administration for not doing enough. They have pointed blame at the Biden administration for, for failing to stop the problem, even though they're on board with what to do about the problem for the political points uh, that exist. So, so past number one of US-Russia in the present is a, is a story of bipartisanship that's driven by policy agreement uh, and purpose, I think, that, that rests above the polarization and partisanship. But there's, a, there's, there's two more layers of the story that we need to, to rest on just a minute. One is that that consensus, that bipartisan consensus is eroding, and it has been eroding over the course of 2022 and now into 2023. We can see this uh, in, in, in a number of ways. There's been strong bipartisan support all along, including for the more than $100 billion in aid that's been provided. But what, what's happening looks to be a, a kind of a, a war fatigue that may be setting in. I'd like to attribute this in part to the uh, short attention span of the American public. Uh, Peter Schrader, uh, a foreign policy scholar, uh, uh, studies US foreign policy toward Africa principally, has argued that uh, in crisis kind of situations, there, there tends to be presidential leadership, but in an extended crises, the longer they go, the more dissent and the more disagreement grow up, particularly in Congress. So maybe some of that is going uh, on here. But, but look at what you see on these two charts. Um, in March of 2022, the two parties largely agree that this invasion is a major threat to U.S. interests. On the first graph, more 50 or 51 percent of both Republicans and uh, Democrats um, uh, see this, right? But look at in January 2023, uh, the, the decline in the sense of threat has been significant, on, really in both parties, but especially among the Republicans. Only 29 percent of Republicans see the Russian invasion of Ukraine as a significant threat uh, as compared to 43% of Democrats. That's a significant, significant gap. The other graph here shows, this is data from the Pew Research Center from a January poll from this year. Uh, the other graph I think is particularly noteworthy uh, is, to, is to see the, the purple lines on there. Uh, for, for Republicans, 40% now of Republicans or leaners 40% think the U.S. is giving too much aid. That's 
an increase of a factor of more than four since March of 22. Democrats, it's only 15%. Uh, that's still an increase from five, but not nearly as great and a much, much smaller dimension. In fact, Republicans that think that we're giving too much aid to Ukraine are about the same number as Democrats who think that it's about right. So the support has has eroded. We could see it in some other me measures. Uh, uh, 48% of Americans now, according to uh, Associated Press poll from, from uh, just a little while ago, 48% uh, of American public back sending weapons to Ukraine, but that was 60% in May of 2022. Um, and that change is almost entirely uh, from Republican voters. Only 39% of Republican voters support sending weapons. That's down from 53 in May. Uh, in early February, just two weeks after this Pew Research poll that you see up here on the screen, uh, Washington Post ABC poll uh, results showed that 50% of Republicans said that the U.S. was doing uh, too much to support Ukraine. So there is a, a war fatigue uh, dissent voice uh, growing, and it's, it's reflected in Congress. Um, and it's a creating a weird, strange bedfellows phenomena, I think, in Congress. And I think this is kind of interesting. So, so here I want to talk about this erosion of support, but I also want to layer in the third pass, which is this cross-partisanship uh, phenomena that looks to be on the rise right now. And I'm going to tie this to something else it, it, when we wrap up here in just a few minutes. Uh, but here's three examples, right? So you, you've got uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, increasingly high profile in the Republican House, uh, uh, saying just about a week ago, I'm, I'm completely against the war in Ukraine. You know who's driving it? It's America. America needs to stop pushing the war in Ukraine. Uh, over on the right side of the screen, you got Josh Hawley, the senator from Missouri, saying uh, again about a week ago, 10 days, uh, here, here's what here's what you can do. You can be the party of Ukraine and the globalists, or you can be the party of East Palestine, where the the train wreck occurred, uh, and the working people of America. Really interesting politicking. But the interesting, I think, most interesting place on the screen is in the middle, uh, which is uh, Representative Jayapal, the head of the Congressional Progressive Caucus, who made a lot of headlines in October for a letter uh, from the CPC to. Uh, President Biden um, encouraging more diplomatic efforts to end the war and and and, and cautioning against prolonging it. Um, this was quickly withdrawn under a lot of uh, criticism. What I think is noteworthy is that that's not the first time that this has been said by the Congressional Progressive Caucus on the Democratic side. This is the more liberal wing of the Democratic Party, and and I'll show you an example of that in just a minute. Now look at <laughs> look at the strange bedfellows here. Uh, I think, uh, and, and the factionalizing that's happening, dissent in the Republican Party against the majority, uh, dissent in the Democratic Party against the, the majority support. And it, it appears to be on the Republican side in particular, on the rise. Uh, you can think of it like this, right? On the left, you have the, the dominant view on the Republican Party, even if it is divided on this, which is championed by such individuals as uh, Mitch McConnell and Tom Cotton uh, in the Senate, Gonzalez and Gallagher in the House. Uh, a quote from McConnell is, uh, is, is uh, a recent one, is that uh, defeating the Russians in Ukraine is the single most important event going on in the world right now, and there should be bipartisan support for this. Against this position is, uh, is the group on the right, led by folks like Hawley and Braun and, and J.D. Vance, newly elected uh, to the Senate, Green, Getz, and Massey in the House. Uh, and, and this is a quote from Hawley very recently. We need a truly nationalist foreign policy that would cut off aid to Ukraine in favor of focusing on the threat from China. Uh, in the middle, I put McCarthy and DeSantis, this, the new speaker and, uh, and one of the uh, probably leading candidates for the Republican nomination in 2024, who have tried to straddle this, uh, not very successfully, uh, but but both of them have taken positions that that you know that that don't reflect either side perfectly, but try to try to thread the needle in ways that probably won't work. Uh, DeSantis on the bottom suggests that getting involved in places like the borderlands, the borderlands is not a great reference for Ukrainian independence, by the way, uh, or Crimea. Uh, or the fear of Russia threatening NATO, none of that's real. 
uh, uh, McCarthy uh, in the late fall after achieving the majority in the House said, we're not going to write a blank check to Ukraine. He's walked that back a little bit, but uh, still. So, so here's the, the kind of the factions, the two factions shaping up on the Republican side in the disagreement. On the Democratic side, you've got similar kind of thing. Uh, the Democratic congressional leadership in the House and Senate uh, and the majority of the rank and file Democrats in both chambers are very strongly in support of as much or more aid to Ukraine in this in this fight. Uh, this is Chris Coons, uh, Senator uh, Chris Coons, uh, who, who said this is uh, lauding the bipartisan support uh, for a long period of time with respect to Russia, talks about how you assistance for Ukraine and its neighbors and uh, will help for liberation of its territory, which is a, a, a goal more aligned with Zelensky than, um, than the limited goals. On the other side, the Congressional Progressive Caucus has been critical. I, I told you about the letter from October. The comment in early spring was even more striking, where uh, Representative Jayapal said, new troop deployments, sweeping sanctions, and the flood of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars in weapons to Ukraine only make things worse. Uh, which sounds a lot more like the dissenters on the Republican side than than their counterparts on the Democratic side. So Democrats are are divided by faction as well. So let's make some sense of this this picture and the story of bipartisanship and and its three features um, before we finish here, and then we can we can have some conversation. So takeaway number one is that Russia policy is and has been mostly bipartisan in the post Cold War world regardless of the direction, from thaw to confrontation, but that bipartisanship has been characterized by two sub-features, uh, the political position taking I mentioned and the, the eroding consensus in the current situation uh, under the uh, uh, pressure uh, of Putin and, uh, and his persistence in this, in this war. The longer it's gone on, the more that erosion has occurred. Um, I think that the story that we've just told and the, the foundations we've established reveal the increasingly complex partisan map and the complex foreign policy orientations it involves in ways that help us to understand how bipartisanship might persist but might be more tenuous than it has been in a while. Uh, and it also becomes vulnerable to manipulation of a couple of kinds. And I wanna elaborate on that just a minute. Uh, Pew in 2021 uh, broke the American political typology down something like this. So you can see the, the subtypes, the, the, the factions within the both Republican and Democratic parties with uh, Republicans dominated by faith and flag conservatives and the populist right. That's about 46%. Uh, the dissenters to the bipartisan agreement on, on confronting Putin are drawn principally from the populist right part of this and the faith and flag right part. And of course, uh, not surprisingly, they tend to be clustered around the, the MAGA movement. Uh, on the Democratic side, you can see uh, a similar kind of, of diffusion or factionalization. Uh, and it's the progressive left that is most uncomfortable uh, with the uh, uh, intervention and, 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 and uh, assistance to Ukraine. And that's where the opposition is coming from, from the Congressional Progressive Caucus, uh, which, which have to be negotiated with. That includes those folks like Jayapal and Lee and uh, uh, Ocasio-Cortez and uh, uh, Omar and others as well. And so if we think about that, uh, our, our, my colleagues, uh, Jeff Lannis and Patrick Holman, not my colleagues at TCU, but my colleagues in foreign policy analysis, have suggested that it, maybe we start thinking about the political spectrum in a little more nuanced way. And their version of this looks something like what you see on the screen right now, uh, with, with four different factions on the Democratic side, ranging from blue dog out to populist and progressive Democrats. And on the Republican side, for country, Main Street, Republican Study Group, and Freedom Caucus factions, with the opposition to Ukraine's aid coming principally from the Freedom Caucus side of it, a, a sizable piece. Uh, 
the, the manipulation that I want to note and the vulnerability comes from two places. And, and let me just use these pictures. You've seen the one on the left already, but I want to call attention to the other part of it, which is the person that was doing the interviewing of Senator Hawley in this situation. Uh, and that is the way that the, uh, the Republican or the right wing media, and particularly people like Tucker Carlson, are, are providing this sort of steady drumbeat of what's really all that bad about Putin and why should we be opposed to him kind of messaging. Uh, it's every night on Fox. And, and that manipulates both the members and the underlying public in some significant ways. But the other person who knows this is Putin. Uh, for a long time now, Putin has tried to prey upon the disagreements in the American body politic and help to sow dissension and, and divide uh, one from another. And in the recent context, he's really doubled down on pitching the American right with a kind of uh, culture war message about uh, opposing pedophilia and and uh, and other things like this, just stopping the destruction of family and all this sort of stuff. These these recent speeches are messages designed uh, as as uh, E.J. Dion in the Washington Post. That's the piece that's referenced here. And observers like Rita Katz, who is a pretty renowned uh, terrorist analyst, terrorism analyst. Excuse me, she, she's not actually a terrorist after all. Uh, uh, have have noted so so this helps to flame the dissension, and and it feeds the base, which is what we're talking about uh, uh, the appeal um, from the dissenters and and what they're making. The Center for Strategic International Studies not too many years ago said, listen, all of this, and obviously not the Ukraine invasion because this predates that, but all of this this complication means we need a different. Uh, scorecard for understanding foreign policy views, especially in Congress. What they presented uh, toward the end of 2018 was a three-part foreign policy view scorecard that differentiated between order-driven, values-driven, and limits-driven views. The most important thing to understand, and I won't read the particular pieces of each of these, but you can, you can see they, they line up as you might expect. But the most important thing to know about these is that you will find both Republicans and Democrats in Congress in each of these columns. And that creates opportunity for bipartisanship, but more of the cross-partisanship kind of nature. And that will be the, 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 I think, key takeaway to that. We'd be remiss, I'm not an American politics specialist, so I won't emphasize this at, at any length, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't note that realignment and redistricting and the changes in the in the electoral map uh, and the ways we elect uh, have a role in this. Because the point, in fact, is that for most members of to getting an office happens in their own party. Competitive districts are shrinking and disappearing, uh, and that, of course, creates uh, drives toward bidding wars to 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 win the biggest share of your.
So it looks like things have dropped on Professor Scott's side. I don't know if he had a a Wi-Fi issue or connection issue or what, but we'll give him a few seconds to see if he pops back on and and can finish up here. Peter, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, we have Jim Scott's cell phone number. Could you call him? That's what I was just about to type to Bob. Yeah, tell Bob to check and see. We Because I, I sent in his cell phone number. Yeah, I've already sent him an email and I'm looking for his number now. Okay, thank you. Um, can you two guys hear me? Yes. The number I... is 405-612-7279. Bob said he was texting him, so that's the same number. Yeah, it should be the same number. He's going to call him. Uh, if he's unable to get back on, uh, maybe... Dave, with your indulgence, we can have sort of a, a conversation. I hope people are dropping off, and I hope that they don't. They'll stick with us for another couple of minutes until we resolve it. And if not, maybe we can have a discussion among those of us who are still still on the call. I see uh, 10, 10 people have dropped off. And please, other people, just wait a, a bit and let's see what we can do. Okay, or um, we can we can start a discussion. You and I can start a discussion, or well, it, it looks I, like I hope, it looks I like hope. we've got him back. I'm back. I'm not sure what happened there. Can you hear me? Yes, yep, we can we hear, you. hear you, and you can see me. Yeah. Terribly sorry about that. I have no idea uh, uh, what happened. I didn't lose my connection or anything like that. But um, maybe, maybe you can just uh, give a sentence or two wrap up, and we can go to the Q and A, uh, and Bob can read the questions out of the chat box. I'll, I'll do it. Uh, the last, um, the last point that I was making uh, about the about the cross partisanship in factions suggests that the um, uh, the bipartisanship is is increasingly possible across these cross partisan factions, but that they tend to be smaller factions that uh, try to shape policy at the margins rather than carry policy, and they're generally um, in in competition with one another, uh, and. Uh, uh, the last the last point I would make is simply that the uh, uh, the individual members of Congress who have frequently tried to take the lead on shaping foreign policy over over the post World War II period we call them congressional foreign policy entrepreneurs and some of my other work uh, with with my colleague Ralph Carter 
Uh, their space for operation and success has shrunk in a polarized and partisan world because the, the bandwidth and the oxygen is sucked out by the political activity of others as well. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll let it stand at that, and then uh, whatever conversation we can have would be great. All right, we'll go to the first question here for you in the chat. And the question is, isn't the divide between isolationists and internationalists still relevant? The Democratic progressives and the Republican far right tend to be isolationists, or is that too simple in the current complex scene? I, I think there is some relevance to it. Uh, and so it's, it's really easy, for example, to, to characterize some of the things that uh, Senator Hawley or uh, or uh, Green, Marjorie Taylor Greene or some others have said as, as being reflective of that isolationist uh, uh, trend or, or font, font in American foreign policy. But I think uh, what, the, what the scholarship uh, and investigations of these perspectives suggest is that, that that can be overblown because it's very selective isolationism, uh, activism on some things, isolationism on others. And so, for example, the work of uh, Adolin that I referenced suggests that you have isolationist tendencies in a lot of different foreign policy views. It's always been a, a minority since World War II uh, of American elites, uh, uh, a, a little bigger share of American public buys into that. And that's the, 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 the portion of the public that's feeding a lot of this. So I think there is a connection and that is relevant. It's not that it's irrelevant, but I think it's 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 too blunt an instrument to capture the nuances of what's going on in the in the debate right now. All right, our next question: uh, Will it be difficult to maintain any policy toward Russia over time, given the fragmented views you document? Yeah, I think that's right. I think a, a central takeaway of the uh, the increasingly polarized and partisan environment in which foreign policy made, whether it involves Russia or not, um, is it's more difficult to sustain policy uh, than, than it used to be. Uh, the, the, the short attention span of the American public feeds uh, short attention theater of uh, American elites. So, so there's uh, an impatience. Um, Russia maybe China are less amenable to these situations because the nature of the challenge and the, 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 the unifying purpose behind it, particularly in the face of invasion, for example, uh, are, are a little bit more unifying. So they have better prospects, but, but they're still diminished, right? Compared to harnessing a long-term effort to contain the Soviet Union and force it to crumble on itself for its internal inconsistencies. It carried 50 years of foreign policy, much more problematic to see something like that happen with the narrow partisan majorities of one side or the other that are that are in place. Um, the cross-partisan factions that are rising um, tend, tend to be organized around those that are sort of establishment oriented and anti-establishment oriented. This is the work of Lantis and Holman's really good on this, right? And the anti-establishment oriented cross-partisan factions are, are the ones that are trying to um, use their, their, their connections. So this coalition, which isn't very big to begin with, but in a narrowly divided Congress, it's enough to make a difference, right? They use this to try and shape policy of a variety of kinds, whether it comes to military action or foreign aid or trade or any number of things. And all of those touch on the Russia situation. All right. How is Putin capitalizing on the growing bipolarization in the U.S.? How can that be counteracted? Uh, Putin preys on it and tries to feed it and has for uh, close to a decade now. Uh, and, and, you know, we I think the work of the bipartisan committee in the Senate on uh, the Putin uh, organized and approved efforts by Russia in 2016 to meddle in the American election and the ample information about similar efforts in the UK and France and Denmark and Germany and elsewhere uh, really, really reveal the Putin playbook, which is to, to, to sow the, uh, the dissension and the chaos um, and 
and the use of misinformation and disinformation, particularly through social media channels. Uh, so, so understanding that is one of the reasons why social media corporations like Twitter and Facebook in the past created uh, some screens to try and, and, and do something about this in the wake of what was revealed of 2016. Most of those things are being taken down now, particularly in Twitter under its current leadership. Uh, and, and that's not going to get us anywhere either. Um, the, 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 the way to understand what to do is to look at what Estonia has done, because Estonia recognized the information warfare initiative by Putin earliest and has been the most proactive in the sort of, I don't know, counter information effort, right? The, for lack of a better term, the, 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 the fact checking uh, efforts. And, and they've, they've been largely successful. Um, and they've been at the forefront of a Europe and NATO-led effort to try and come up with a cyber policy that does these sorts of things to combat the, the, the manipulations in that. Um, but, you know, to boil it all down in, a, in the simplest possible way, the, the Russian effort to prey on this depends on a couple of things, one of which is the access to social media through these bot farms and, uh, and that where they can create fake accounts and, and, and generate messaging that is then picked up, shared, and it, it, it just diffuses throughout various networks. Who would be foreign policy entrepreneurs now in the recent Congresses? In the recent Congresses? Well, uh, you know, one might argue that, jo that Josh Hawley is entrepreneurial, although I think he's more uh, politically expedient uh, than not. Lindsey Graham has been a, a congressional foreign policy entrepreneur uh, for, uh, for a long time. He, uh, in, in uh, collaboration with uh, John McCain, when Senator McCain was alive, uh, were very active. Um, indeed, uh, Senator Graham was a, a leading voice in the efforts to try and, and take a different course than the Trump administration wanted, believe it or not, and maybe that's hard to believe, but on one initiative, which I've, uh, I've been done doing some work on, which is on democracy assistance by the United States to other countries. Uh, Senator Graham uh, basically told the Trump administration, your desire to cut that funding in the foreign aid bill is not going to work. We need to do more, not less. And then he was the architect of a whole series of changes in, in, in that. Uh, so, so Graham is an example of, of, of one of these. Chris Murphy from uh, Connecticut, uh, a Warner from uh, Virginia. Uh, these are on the Senate side, some of the, the leading voices as well. Um, and and there, there's a, a lesser movement on the House. So much of the House has been politicized that there are fewer, um, although they, they do still exist. There seems to be a great divide within the U.S. regarding taking control of human decisions and a desire to control over every decision at all levels, from foreign policy to religious decisions, reproductive choices, medicines. Is this a cycle of political views, and is it normal and unfortunate? That's a, that's a really great puzzle. I, I don't know that I have a good answer to that at all. Uh, I think the, the, you know, the, the, the tension between freedom and order is one of the the persistent struggles in human society for a very long time. And we're on a, a side of this where the control side or the, the, the order side uh, is, is being dominated by some voices rather than, than others. And this is a, a global challenge, uh, I think, in a lot of ways. So I don't really have a good insight on, uh, on that. And I'm sorry for that. I think it's a really great question. And it's one that keeps me up at night. <laughs> Isn't it true that time is not on the side of Zelensky and Biden, and so a break is coming, and Zelensky will have to engage in territorial compromise because he is going to lose full U.S. support? I think that there's a, a strong inference that that, that that might be the case, right? Uh, but I, I don't agree with it, and here's why I don't agree with it. Um, I, I think that the, the time, that time is not on the side of, of Russia, uh, even more than it's not on the side of anybody. Surely, uh, being being persistent and 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 stable in a foreign policy initiative 
is more difficult in the environment we live in for the any American president. And you know, we're into the 2024 election cycle and a lot could change and that that means something. But the fact is that that Russia, I think the fact is that uh, that that Russia has and will continue to find it increasingly difficult to uh, to, to to exact its aims and increasingly costly to continue the war. Uh, I think by almost all accounts, the uh, the success of Russian military operations and logistical operations behind them has been deteriorating substantially. And the costs to the Russian society of that operation and the, the increasingly uh, significant sanctions bite that uh, exists um, make, make it make it less likely that Russia can persist than, than that Zelensky has to do something else. Uh, the, the, the Ukrainian ability to resist, I think, is, is only being strengthened uh, with the, the improvements to their uh, weapons base and their training and their access to those resources. Success breeds success. The longer that they don't lose, the, the, the more opportunity they have uh, to win, I think. I don't know that that means seizing back all the territory. Uh, but I'm, I'm not sure it doesn't mean having the more advantage situation in, uh, a, uh, in a, a more diplomatic solution, which I'm not sure is possible as long as Putin is in power anyway. Are you really saying there is an equivalency between Marjorie Taylor Greene's attention-seeking rants and Mitch McConnell flying to Munich and reassuring Europeans that America is in for the long haul? No, not substantively, but procedurally, I think so. Uh, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene and Mitch McConnell are, are are not equivalent and not alike in very many ways. My my point was simply to to position them as taking two different views on the Ukraine conflict, rather than being equivalent. It's clearly the case that the bipartisan success of Russian of the policy toward Russia uh, on Ukraine, the Biden administration's approach, rests on the strong support of establishment Republicans and establishment Democrats, Mitch McConnell, Lindsey Graham, uh, the, the, the lion's share of, uh, of Republicans in both House and Senate, more in the Senate than the House. Remember though, in May of 2022, before war fatigue, 11 of 50 Republicans, voted against the aid package to Ukraine when they really, really, really needed it. Uh, and I mean, that's 20%. And that's not, that's not nothing. Um, I don't know how one looks at the current composition of the House of Representatives and views Marjorie Taylor Greene as, as, as irrelevant. Uh, that faction is on the margins of a narrowly divided House carries a lot of weight. It's why Speaker McCarthy had to make so much effort and so many uh, concessions in order to become Speaker. Uh, so I, I no, I'm, I'm not trying to fall into some false equivalency, uh, and, and only to note that there is dissent in the Republican Party between a, a faction that supports current US policy and wants more, and a faction that does not and wants less. All right, this is our last question that's in the chat. Uh, America seems to function better and is more united when we have an enemy. Should we recreate the Cold War with Russia? You know, Bill Clinton said in 1993, I think, uh, he was quoted as saying, gosh, I miss the Cold War. And it was precisely because of that sentiment that I think those words came out of his mouth. No, we don't miss the Cold War. And it's costs and its fear and its nuclear stalemate and its its it toll in lives and treasure and, and, and its impact on people around the world. But in terms of a unifying force, uh, the clarity of the threat and the um, appeal of the purpose were unifying factors. And apart from those two things, it's hard to see in the current uh, environment in the current context, a similar kind of unifying force for a lasting period of time. So I don't know that it's our choice whether to recreate the Cold War. It looks to me like Vladimir Putin has decided to, to throw all the dice in on 
uh, this gambit to try and uh, enact his vision, his anti-Western, anti-liberal vision, and uh, roll back American and Western influence uh, around the, the margins. I think the more likely contender for a focusing challenge might be might not be Russia. Uh, it might lie elsewhere, and perhaps in China, uh, as a more serious competitor, more serious threat for the uh, long-term position of the United States in the world. Um, and I would note that these two examples, though, Russia and China, are the places in American foreign policy around which more bipartisan consensus exists uh, than anywhere else. So, you know, at the end of the day, there's some truth to what you say. Uh, the combination of, of clarity of threat, of existential threat, uh, and um, appealing purpose, even morally appealing purpose, uh, are, are the, the, it seems to me, the two foundational points for the a, a sort of consensus. Um, whether those can be developed in the absence of such threats uh, is hard to see. Okay, I was just talking with Peter. That's our last question in the chat, but we have some comments. Uh, Peter, do you want to open it up to live Q&A now? And sure, David Dyke has put a comment in the uh, in the chat. Uh, Dave, why don't you uh, read it or, or speak it out and let uh, Professor Scott respond? Yeah, everyone should be able to unmute and turn your video on now. Or if not, I'll read. I'll read it for him. I I I am muted. I was just okay. concerned about uh, uh, watching the debates between Romney and Obama, and they they asked the two contenders, you know, which which country posed the greatest threat to the United States, and Romney said, "Oh, Russia," and and Obama seemed rather shocked and retorted that Russia was just a has been and no longer a threat, and. Uh, uh, I think he misjudged them. I, I couldn't agree more, honestly. Uh, I think uh, in, in some respects, the, the ridicule that, uh, that Mitt Romney faced over that comment um, was, was unfounded or unwarranted. And history has not been kind to Obama's take on that. Um, Romney, I guess, has deserved, deserves an apology from some people because um, he wasn't he wasn't wrong. Now, maybe he was wrong in terms of threat in the sense of long-term and capable, but he certainly wasn't wrong in terms of intent. Uh, uh, you know, the Putin vision is a, is a threatening vision. Whether Russia is capable of enacting that vision outside of its borderlands is another question. The, the other point, I guess, is that when uh, Putin invaded Crimea and, and uh, the Ukrainians asked for help, uh, they got uh, field rations from the United States. Yeah, uh, and and unfortunately at that time, that was also a bipartisan consensus. That was largely the position that there was little we could do. There were dissenters to that, of course, uh, but, uh, but that's right. Now, the U.S. did spend a fair amount of effort after 1914 and leading into 2022 uh, with some NATO allies to try and train up and provision uh, the Ukrainian forces in ways that had, uh, that helped them to be able to uh, resist the, uh, the, the the initial attack um, from Russia last year. Uh, so so some progress was made after 2014, um, and, uh, and 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 that, but certainly not on the um, resistance. Or, or, or addressing the, the territorial seizure of Crimea. Thank you. Uh, Beth Ann Brooks, you have uh, your hand raised. Um, I wanted to ask Professor Scott if, I'm sorry if there's an echo, if um, you found it at all encouraging vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Ukrainian invasion, um, Estonia's support, uh, for uh, Ukraine, knowing that they could be next. But it was interesting to hear about their 
um, election and the fact that I believe per capita, there are about 1 million people in that country, they have actually uh, contributed more uh, to uh, Ukraine uh, than It trailed off at the very end there, but but I think I got the gist of that. I, I think that's exactly right. I just saw a chart uh, yesterday or the day before that broke down uh, support and assistance to Ukraine per capita by the countries around them and in, in North America. And and uh, the the level of support per capita, sort of widow's might kind of uh, levels, uh, from from Lithuania and Latvia and Estonia, uh, the, the frontline states, who you know by by most accounts are are threatened by the next step, um, it's really really impressive. Uh, and uh, you know I I, I have a a, a a picture. It's a meme really that I use in any talks about this uh, current situation in Ukraine. And it basically it's an award plaque that is an award given to Vladimir Putin as the NATO salesman of the year. And, and, I, and I think there's some merit to that, right? Uh, is a re-enter, and, and President Biden deserves credit as well. Uh, he's, he's managed a fractious in, uh, environment pretty well with the NATO allies in ways that are, are admirable. But it is certainly the case that, that if, you were, if you were intending to uh, divide NATO, um, and that was your goal. You couldn't have gone any further in the other direction than Vladimir Putin has done. Thank you. I think you could add Poland to the Baltic states. Yes, yes Poland as well. Absolutely. We have time for one or two more questions or comments. If anyone would like to unmute or put something in the chat. I have a question. Um, Ukraine is not part of NATO ostensibly because it was so corrupt as compared to other Eastern European countries and didn't merit entry into NATO. And because of that corruption, it didn't merit military aid after the, or around the Crimean invasion. Is Ukraine substantially less corrupt today or not? Well, I think uh, I think there's a I think there's a deeper subtext there. Um, so I, 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 surely this is a part of it. U Ukraine is a, not a, a leading candidate for NATO expansion in either in any of the initial waves of that, principally because of the nature of the relationship between the regime and Russia, and sub uh, secondarily its own problems. After 2014. NATO NATO expansion to include Ukraine is a non-starter of an idea because Russian troops are on the ground in Ukraine. And, and uh, I mean, one lesson that Putin has taken is that if you have troops in, in a country, NATO won't expand uh, to include that country because NATO is not seeking a direct military confrontation. Uh, so corruption has been a political problem in Ukraine for a very long time, going back to the end of the Cold War and before. Um, I think the, uh, the, that story is not principally a story of what happens as Ukraine seeks more orientation to the West. I think it's a, a story of the legacy leadership and political structures from the Soviet and post-Soviet context. Um, so I think that there's, there's still corruption problems, but Ukraine has made, made strides, made progress uh, on those things. And, uh, the transition after uh, the Maiden re uh, Revolution uh, in 2014 and the transition to different leadership has been uh, important in that. And oh. I, say, I say that as a non-specialist in Ukrainian politics. So uh, everything I say should be taken with a grain of salt on that one. Okay, this is magic. It's, uh, it's 8.30. And, uh, and we've run out of questions. Uh, Professor Scott, would you like to offer any concluding remarks? Uh, I, I, I would offer two. Uh, uh, I, I wanna say that uh, I appreciate the opportunity to come and talk about the effects of the polarized and partisan context of American foreign policy. It's something that is 
near and dear to the work that I've done in my own uh, scholarly life. So I'm really grateful for that. And, and I think the, the takeaway on it is that anybody in the White House, any president in the White House, any leader of Congress uh, on, in either chamber uh, is in for a bumpy ride because of these changes. Uh, so that's the one. The other is to apologize for the technical glitch that got me thrown off of Zoom there for a few minutes and, uh, and for, the, for the struggle that I had to, to get myself back onto it. Uh, but uh, I appreciate your patience with me. Thank you again for letting me join you. Maybe we can blame that on a on a balloon that's flying overhead uh, over Fort Worth. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Scott, for your uh, illuminating uh, remarks and 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 great uh, and candid response to the to the questions. Uh, thank you for joining us next week uh, in our final uh, talk for this series. Uh, Professor Kevin Smith from the University of Nebraska Lincoln. We'll be talking on political polarization in the United States and what it might mean. So we all have a contrast to the uh, to the to the international perspective to see what's happening uh, domestically. Uh, so thank you all very much, and we hope we'll see you and your friends uh, next week. Thanks again, Professor Scott. Good night, all. My great pleasure. Good night. <laughs>